I'm Lissetta Rapessa, and this is Living the Classical Life. So it's Lisette. Lisette. Not Lisette. Not, you can say Lisette if you like. Yes. <laughs> if we were in France, I would say Lisette. Right. But I just say Lisette, which is the most incorrect way to pronounce my name. The most incorrect. It's the most incorrect. Because well, it's neither Spanish or French, and I'm Hispanic, and my family's from Cuba, and my mother says Lisette when she speaks Spanish. But we're not in a Spanish-speaking country, so I say Lisette, which is also wrong. Well, well the cool thing about that is that is really a, a typical cross-section of the new America in terms of yeah. the demographics. And, and I think cultural identity is a real thing um, for some people, um, particularly when your cultural background is quite singular. Um, mine is, is Latin American, Cuban. And then my great grandparents are from Spain, so I don't have a lot of mixture. I have one very clear um, background, a culture. Music that I listened to that was very particular growing up, I spoke a very specific type of accent. Um, when I speak Spanish, I have a Cuban accent, <clears throat> and it was my first language. Um, and I do think that that shaped my outlook <clears throat> on life because it shaped my perception of what being an American was because we weren't, I was a first generation born in this country and my parents always taught me, you know, now you're very lucky that you were born here because in Cuba you wouldn't have toys, you wouldn't have, you know, in school you wouldn't have crayons to color with, that you wouldn't, you know, your teachers would tell you that Castro uh, is God and, you know, that, so I was kind of indoctrinated with the Cuban mentality, at least the Cuban refugee mentality of we are very lucky to be here and the United States is our salvation, and we're gonna do everything to merit our being in this country. Lizette, thank you so much for being on Living the Classical Life. We're delighted to welcome you. Thank you very much for having me today. I wanted to start by asking you about the fact that you were featured in Runner's World <laughs> magazine, which is something that surprised me. I mean, the world of singers, the world of opera singers, uh, art song singers, and then running. I mean, maybe it should not be that surprising, but I know that this has followed a particular trajectory in your life. Yeah. How did that happen? I was getting ready, after I finished the Young Artist Program at the Met, we were planning our first, my husband and I were planning our first kind of international little tour, if you will, which was the first time I would ever be doing an engagement away from the United States. Um, and I had already been working out and stuff because I had lost a lot of weight before. Um, and that was in the interest of my health, my career, my life, my happiness, my ability to perform on stage, that's separate. We got to a point where I wasn't gonna be able to go to my gym anymore because <laughs> we were gonna be out of town for four months. I thought, gee, well, what can we do to keep exercising? Because I'm the type of person that will gain weight very easily um, and I knew I needed to do something. And so I said, well, I'm terrible at running. How about you? 
My husband said, well, I'm terrible at running too. I said, perfect, let's do that. We're terrible at running. Let's make ourselves not terrible at running by, by running. <laughs> so the decision was very conscious. Very, it, didn't, some, it was not something I stumbled into at all. It's not something that I did because other people were doing it and it was cool. It was something I did because I was terrible at it and I wanted to be better. And I needed something that I could do away from my gym at home. Something that I could do on the road, something that was cheap, something that, was, uh, that would get me outside and get me breathing fresh air, you know. And um, we started one summer, and it was hot and awful and miserable. And um, we said, okay, well, that was awful. Let's try again tomorrow. Okay, we'll try again tomorrow. And we just kind of kept doing it until we started to get better, because you do get better, even at things that you're terrible at, if you practice them. Um, and eventually we started running races and it just kind of became an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that you did for yourself in the, mm -hmm. in the interest of your... My health. Feeling good. Yeah. So my question or ponderance here is image. How, how, how much of that is really in your world of awareness? After I lost weight, and I, I lost weight in, when I was an adult. Not okay. when I was a teenager and not <laughs> when I was, you know, vulnerable. <laughs> it was much, it was in my 20s. I spent my entire 20s basically slowly losing weight. It took me five years of solid, solid, just determination, determination to actually do that. Uh, and then I've been maintaining ever since. I've maintained this weight for almost 10 years, which is very hard to do. That's hard to do on the road. Maintenance is worse <clears throat> than weight loss, if, especially if your tendency is toward... Uh, obesity, which is what I was when I, when I first, before I started um, consciously trying to lose weight, I was obese, uh, medically, clinically. And, um, and my doctors have been telling me for years, you know, I needed to do that. But I never lost weight because I thought this is going to make me glamorous and beautiful. Because it doesn't. Weight has nothing to do with beauty. Because beauty is perception. And some people don't like skinny girls. Some people don't like heavy girls. Some people don't like curves. Some people love curves. It, it, everyone has a different opinion. And no matter how much weight you lose and how thin you get or how whatever glamorous you think you get, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't find you attractive. And I figured that out after I lost weight. So as far as image, once you get to a certain level in your career, I feel like there is a certain um, necessity to portray yourself in the best way possible mm -hmm. because so many eyes are on you. And I think this is why people use Instagram and use social media to put, I mean, everyone does this to an extent, even not singers. They want to put the best of themselves on social media because they want people to perceive that they've got it all together that they're happy, that they're in love, that they're rich, that they're glamorous. You know, the double-edged sword of that. I mean, my Instagram, my Instagram is a mixture of me in glamorous gowns, me in opera photographs, and me with it's sweaty and disgusting from running with no makeup on. And if you went through my Instagram, you would not understand who I am. <laughs> You'd be like, who is this person? Is Because I'm not a model. I don't try to be a model. I take pictures. I notice that pictures that are thirsty, do better hmm. as far as engagement because people go, oh, look how they stop when they see a photo of what they perceive to be an attractive woman or an attractive man. It's the same thing. You know, they do better than my running pictures do as far as if you count likes, you know, or comments. But that's not, that's Instagram's fault. <laughs> you know, that's not um, a person's fault. You know, if, if a person wants to do well on Instagram, they know if they show more skin, they get more likes. I mean, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm wondering you know? in these cases of beautiful people with a lot of followers, mm -hmm. are people, <clears throat> our audiences in this mm -hmm. case, are people attracted to that because of the beauty or are they attracted sure. to that because they want to be you? Both. I always think that a beautiful person, the ones that I've observed anyway, you either hate them or you want to be them. Hmm. And it's a mixture of both, I think, most of the time. I think people cannot deny, no matter how much they try, how much they, in their brain they try to enlighten themselves and say, beauty doesn't matter, looks don't matter. No matter how much people try to convince themselves of that, it is simply not true. It is a biological drive as a human being that you perceive beauty and you are attracted to it. Beauty in other human beings, beauty in nature, beauty in 
in, in art, beauty, in everything. That's why people love opera. Opera is beautiful. If opera were ugly, people wouldn't go. I mean, if ballet were ugly, people wouldn't watch. It's the kind of thing, I mean, that's why um, people say sex sells, but, and that's a, a very uh, carnal way to, to write it down. Right. But it isn't just sex, it's just the idea of attraction to something else that's beautiful. And that's a natural instinct. And that's why singers or performers become pressured, not in a negative way, but have feel some sort of, of responsibility, if you will, to represent the most beautiful things that they can of themselves if they want to be presented in a certain way in certain roles on stage. So if you have a voice that sounds like, to the ear, it sounds like a Brunhilde, and I want to see this person sing a beautiful Brunhilde, you're probably a very rare singer because there are not a lot of Brunhildes in the world. But if you have a voice that sounds like Susanna or that sounds like a Musetta uh, or that sounds like a character that is, a, so, that is supposed to be a typically beautiful character, such as Manon. If you have a voice that sounds like that and you don't look like that, you won't have as many opportunities to per perform that role as someone who does. And this is why singers get under pressure to really take care of their appearance and to present themselves at the most attractive that they possibly can. I think men and women actually experience this as well. So at some point, speaking of the Met mm -hmm. and Manon, mm -hmm. they were searching for a Manon. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there was less than a year mm -hmm. before the production. Yes. When you're presented with an opportunity like that, mm -hmm. how do you know that you're ready? Two things went through my mind. One was, oh, to never have sung Manon and sing it for the first time at the Met, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. But the second thing was, for the Met to not have offered me anything of this um, this big yet, and to then offer me this, is the Met telling me, we think you're ready. The Met knows me. <laughs> the Met is a company that I grew up with. It's a company that I studied at. It's where I learned all of my, <clears throat> where I really started all of my major operatic training, my roles, my languages, style, acting, all of those things. I prepared at the Met from the time I was in my early 20s. And I thought, if any company knows what I'm capable of and not capable of, it's the Metropolitan Opera. So I took that as a huge compliment because I thought, wow, they're putting a lot of responsibility on me and they feel like they know I can do it. But I still need to know, I need to know that I can do it. Um, and so I took some time to look through the role and I said, you know what, I think I can do it because I knew vocally where I would be at the, by the time. I knew kind of where my voice was kind of heading when I got the offer. It's actually better that you get an offer a year out rather than five years out because five years out is a long time for a singer mm. to real. You can't predict the future and so many things. I mean, in one in the course of one year, your voice changes a lot depending on what you're singing, what you're going through, and if you have a hormonal shift or you get sick or whatever. All of these things affect your voice. Um, and so I was actually kind of delighted that I was like, oh, okay, it's now or never, or, because I didn't have any other offers for Manon. <clears throat> so I thought, you know, I've sung in French, a few roles in French. I'd sung Leila, I'd sung Ophélie in Hamlet, um, I had sung The Daughter of the Regiment, which is an Italian role, but is in French. So I had sung a lot in I had sung Marguerite de Valois. Um, so I had sung some French roles. It wasn't like I was being offered something that I had no business touching. <laughs> um, and I knew Massenet because I love French music. I've sung Massenet before, uh, a smaller role in Werther, but still, I had sung the composer. I, I felt like, you know what? This isn't something that's totally out of my league. I bet if I studied and applied myself, I could probably do a, a good job. And I knew that, I, that there were other interpreters of Manon that were similar to my voice type, like Beverly Sills. Um, and that made me feel at ease because I also, you know, when you get offered a role that's that big, you have to look at what the references are mm -hmm. as far as who sings it. And Manuel rec in recent past had been sung by Netrebko, had been sung by Damrau, who are two totally different singers. Completely. Which made me think, oh, that means that there's a range there of what's acceptable or what's workable as far as voice type is concerned. There are not a lot of roles that are like that. Some roles are like exclusively must be sung by a very particular voice type. And this one isn't. This one has more of a range. So um, 
I, I thought, you know, I'm going to apply my voice to it and do my best with it. It won't be to everyone's taste. That's okay. Hmm. It is a respectable, um, I will do an respectable, hopefully a respectable performance of it that enough people will appreciate to say that it's valid. So here you are at the Met, a new role, increasing visibility, <coughs> increased, mm -hmm. perhaps, as you said, responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a sense of how you find your ideal headspace mm -hmm. in putting an experience like that into the context of finding your most creative ease mm -hmm. and pushing out those doubts mm -hmm. and pushing out whatever nerves are there inherent to all of us. Yes, that's a wonderful question. Um, when I work on a new role, or even in a role that I've sung many times, I'm a very disciplined uh, person who a person who prepares in a very disciplined way, in the sense that I practice a specific way, I practice with specific goals, I take things apart, I analyze them. You know, um, I do a lot of background work, I do a lot of language work. That to me takes a lot of studious kind. It's just who I've always been. I'm a studious person. Um, before I even start singing, that I do that kind of stuff. Because I feel like <clears throat> if your brain is in check, <clears throat> your body will follow. If your brain is in check, your, um, your creative juices will be free. <laughs> because your, you will know your marks that you have to hit. Um, and then when you get on stage, you have to kind of forget all of that hopefully forget all of that, and then be free and be in the moment. And that's the big challenge. Is it be possible to forget yes. that? And, uh, <laughs> for me, I, I have to coach myself, admittedly, through a lot of things, especially if it's a role that's new for me and it's not quite 100% settled yet. It's always, and you're, you're nervous. You can't help but be nervous. It's the Met. Even if it wasn't the Met, you'd be nervous. It's the first time doing a big part like that. Uh, and nerves absolutely um, can sabotage y all of your preparation that you've done. But if you're, if you have, this is why experience is important. If you know, look, I've sung on big stages before. I've sung at the Met before. I've sung Massane before. I trust my experience and my preparation. I know I'm going to be okay. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like when you run a marathon. If you've trained and you're healthy, and you're not injured, you will be okay because you've trained, you've prepared, you trust in your training. It's like you put the miles in the bank. And so when I know that I've put the training in the bank, then I know I'm gonna be okay. Well, you described at some point in your life having the feeling that others liked you, mm -hmm. but did you always like yourself? Oh, did I always like myself? You know, I always thought I could make myself a person that I could like more. Hmm. I always thought if there was something in myself that I didn't care for, a quality, um, that I could fix it if I just worked hard enough. So look, if I didn't, and I would always, I was always very goal oriented. So I would say to myself, okay, I'm not, I don't have that many friends, but do I like the friends that I do have? Yes, I love them. I'm, I think they're wonderful. In fact, this is great. Okay, then I don't need more friends. So we can X that off the list. And then I would say, okay, well, um, I'm, I don't get invited to parties and stuff all that much. You know, is there something about my personality that maybe people don't care for? Hmm, maybe I could be nicer. Maybe I could try and smile more. Maybe if I'm more friendly, if I try to put on a happy face more often for people instead of being in gloomy <laughs> energy around them, they'll like me more. And then I'll in turn like myself more because I've stopped being negative. Now I can actually, maybe I can be positive and actually maybe I'll feel better and I'll like myself more. Yeah, I feel like uh, there, and then, you know, if I think, okay, if I wanna get this role or win this competition or whatever, there's the goal, the goal is to win, to succeed, to gain something. What do I have to do to get that? <laughs> so I've always been a goal-oriented person. In other words, I'm not just like, oh, whatever happens. No, I've never been like that. I've always said if I want something, I have to, f I can, if, if possible, I can find a way to make that happen for me by putting something else, something active into the universe, an active energy, an active desire, an active um, 
even an, act, an activity of some kind. If I know I'm being proactive at losing weight, I will lose weight. I, I, that I'm, and that's very hyper logical. The problem with that approach is life's not logical. Humans aren't logical, humans aren't rational. Emotions aren't rational. I think if I just love you enough, you'll love me too. Does that work? No, I mean, sometimes, but not everybody's gonna do that. Not everybody's gonna respond that way. And so sometimes I've crashed headfirst into the brick of the irrational nature of human beings, we, even within myself. I went, listen, why? Because I just want things to be fair and just. And I always think, if you put this in, you will get that result. That's too logical, it's too mathematical. I'm not even good at math, like, but I somehow <laughs> believe that. I have that like, deep belief in life about everything. And it's awful, it's a horrible trait. Because it always makes me, that's what gives me jealousy. That's what gives me uh, a sense of dissatisfaction. Not all the time, but some, about certain things. Is it, pos God, is it possible to make progress with this? I think awareness is the first, <laughs> the first step. <laughs> Being aware, I didn't even realize that that was what I was struggling with until my mom and I talked about it. Now this is, I'm talking post 30 year old life right. issues about adulting. Yes. Mom, I did this and this and this, why am I not getting this and that and that? And she says, because God doesn't want that for you. That's my mom's explanation. <laughs> God doesn't want that for you right now. Well, why not? Why would God give me A, B, C, and D? Why would God give me, it's kind of like saying, why would God give me a turkey, turnips, an oven, oil, and a basting and tell me not to make a Thanksgiving turkey? I have all the ingredients, where's my Thanksgiving turkey? And I mean this about lots of different things in life, but I mean, it's just a general kind of philosophy. And my mom would say, because God doesn't want you to eat the turkey right now. God is, wants you to do, God wants you to be vegetarian. Well, then why do I have this giant turkey? You know, yeah. it's kind of, um, and that's a, I could, I, never could come to grips with that reality or that concept that just because you put in a certain thing, you, you will get a result. Um, oof. And can you, can you work through that? Yes, you have to be aware when you're doing that. At least I have to be aware when I'm doing that, when I'm expecting a result based on an input. How did you choose to become a musician? Well, I, like I said, I was born singing. I was born into a musical family. I was guided um, into great music my whole life. My mother was a singer. My grandfather was a singer. We had records at home of opera. My grandfather was a great lover of opera, recorded every single broadcast he could get from the day he came to America. <laughs> every radio broadcast that the Met would put on the weekends, he would record. And he kept a huge archive. Um, of everything he'd ever recorded. He would write the cast, I and mean, he was very meticulous about keeping records of everything he had ever recorded. And he bought every disc or you know, CD he could get his hands on because my grandfather loved opera so much. So I grew up in a household that nurtured this art form. Um, so I was always exposed to it. Now, was I in love with opera my whole life? No, that was, my mother loved opera like crazy. My mom wanted to be a singer. My mom, that's all she wanted in life. But. She gave up her dream because of reality. She had three small children. My father had muscular dystrophy. My mom had to support us in some way. My father's health was declining, and my mom became a music teacher. And I always thought that was my mom's dream. I want to be a musician too, but I don't want to do my mom's dream. I want to do something else. So I became a flute player because I fell in love with the flute watching an orchestral concert. I was like, what's that shiny thing? That I want to play that. <laughs> and <laughs> that's how it started. Um, and, and I started playing flute and I loved being in an orchestra. I loved being in band. I loved it. I was in choir for a very short period of time and I hated being in choir. Really? Because I found singers so petty and so <laughs> jealous and so silly and so mean to each other. Where, you know, they were always like, she has a wobbly vibrato. She doesn't sing straight tone, Ugh, whatever. And it, she sings too loud. Oh my God. Like not just all to each other all the time. It's very catty. I hated that. But band, oh, fabulous. Wonderful. Because everybody played something different. There were only a few flute players, you know, and only a few, and that was it. There weren't like 30 sopranos. There were like, you know, six flute players, you know, and amongst flute players. Now flute players can be a catty bunch, but they, flute players are determined people. And that's exactly the instrument that I needed. An instrument that was, tough and difficult and cutthroat, and that's what I wanted. And I loved it. And I was so into it, 
Again, I thought band camaraderie was the best camaraderie in the world. Just, ugh. So I didn't want to give up music. I didn't want to give up ensemble playing. I didn't want to give up um, being surrounded by other people who loved music and respected me and that I could respect and that I could learn from and I could listen to. Um, to do what? To be in a, to be, to make money? Like. <laughs> so you have a lot of young viewers who are aspiring performers, conservatory students. Mm -hmm. They see your success and they wonder about the times that they, and inevitably probably you, are feeling self-doubts mm -hmm. or trying to overcome disappointments. Mm -hmm. And they're wondering what your strategies are on mindset, or perhaps it's just a feeling, in how to navigate those periods of your life. Well, rejection never stops, even when you're successful, even mm. when you're the star of a show. There are gonna be, you know, criticisms and stuff, and there are certainly gonna be people who say, no, sorry, not acceptable. Um, and that filtering criticism, particularly criticism, is one of the most important things a singer has to learn to do, and a musician also has to learn to do. You have to find a way to process it in a healthy way, or it will stop you from doing it. Um, so you have to build a healthy relationship with your work and your interpretation and your creative output and who you are as a human being. It's hard to separate the two sometimes as a singer because when I was a flutist, I was better at this. If I played my scales wrong or made a mistake, my teacher would say, you made a mistake here, 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 do it again. And I would go, okay, and I would just do it again. But then when I was done, I could put the flute in a box and, you know, and it wasn't inside my body. Your voice is inside your body. So if someone says, you sang that note flat, it's a bit more like, oh, <clears throat> it's a bit more of a personal, not an attack, but a personal, um, what's the word? It's a personal comment. I mean, it comes across more personal. This is why singers are so sensitive. <laughs> 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 and singers can't, you know, have a hard time with criticism because we can't change it. It's kind of like, if someone says, I don't like your vibrato, or I, I, your vibrato is blank, too blank, too slow, too fast, too wobbly, too whatever, there's nothing you can really do to change that within reason. You might be able to change it a little, but your vibrato is a natural vibrato. Whereas if you're a violinist, you can change your vibrato with your, the speed of how you're moving your hand. Piano doesn't have to worry about it because piano doesn't have a vibrato. If the piano sounds like crap, it's the piano's fault. If you, as long as you're playing what you, knew, what you know you need to be doing and people have, oh, I don't like the sound of that piano, you don't have to take it personally because it's not you. And that's the big difference that I discovered going from being an instrumentalist to being a singer. Now, when you get rejected as in, you don't get a role, you didn't win first place, you weren't accepted into this conservatory. This teacher doesn't want you in their studio, whatever. Um, it's very, as a singer, it's very hard not to take those things personally. But I'm so thankful that I was an instrumentalist first, so that I learned to accept no and not take it as a personal attack, you know? So, I mean, my advice to people is always separate constructive criticism from destructive criticism, first of all, because there is both figure out if there's something you can actively do to fix whatever that is that that person is saying that you need to fix. And it may not be something you even need to fix. You also need to consider the source of the criticism. If the criticism is simply, um, you need to work on your French because I, you have issues with your vowels and blah, 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 you can fix that. So fix it. <laughs> I mean, I, get upset about that. There's no reason to get upset about that. To get upset would be, sorry, honey, you're not tall enough to play this role because we're hiring a, you know, a soprano who's much taller than you and you're simply not tall enough, sorry. That's worth getting upset over because that's unfair. It's unfortunate and there's nothing you can do about it. So I can see, yes, you get upset about that because damn, how am I supposed to make myself taller? Okay, now let me go try again. But you know, we run into those things all the time, unfortunately, <laughs> you know. They said you keep a wonderfully lively, refreshing, direct <laughs> Q&A blog on YouTube, which I've followed with great amusement. 
is, is this uh, a fun way to keep in touch with your audience? Is, is it important for you to contact your audience or, or is this more of a, a form of teaching? Um, I think it's both. I, uh, I, don't, I didn't reach out on purpose. People reached out to me with numerous questions over time. Um, you know, I, my, all of my social media presence uh, is, is organic. I've never um, promoted anything as far as like, you know, paying to promote and stuff like that because I actually kind of, for years, I was kind of hesitant even towards pushing for social media because I felt like it was a bit fake. But I understand that it's necessary and it's important. And because I have so many young followers that reach out to me through social media, I realized, wow, it's a communication tool more than anything. Um, and I get questions all the time, people asking, you know, this or that. I'm working on Lucia. Do you have any advice for how I should sing this or that? Or, I said, I, I, you know, I'm starting this role for the first time and I'm having a hard time with recits. You know, is there some advice you have for learning music faster? Or whatever. I mean, so many people ask me things about technical, vocal technique mm -hmm. things. Enough I get that. those questions a lot. Right. Um, not even so much about what can I do better, more of just like, how do you do this? How do you personally achieve this sound or that? color or blah, blah, blah. Is there a technical thing that you're doing? How do you go from running to singing? How can you run? Like, I, I'm trying to run, and then I go to my voice lesson after, and I can't breathe. What am I doing wrong? You know. So I get these questions a lot. And I always respond, for years, I was responding to people one by one, personally, with like a big, long, <laughs> three-paragraph message. And I was like, you know what? But you don't have enough time for that. Well, I would make the time for it if there were fewer people asking. <laughs> but because it started kind of increase, increasing, I was like, you know what? I could probably explain these things better if I just kind of address them all at once. And so my husband and I had this idea to just sit down and do a Q&A video where I address the most common questions that I get. Um, it, in, in kind of general terms, that can basically help everyone. And people will take from it what they will. If people don't like the advice, it doesn't work for them they're free to skip it, you know? Um, and I did that. I, was, I made four big, long videos about the business, about health and fitness, about technique, and then just questions about me that people ask me all the time. Um, and I got a lot of views and stuff. And I still get questions. I get new questions. Oh, now you've done this. Now can you do a Q&A about this? Can you do a Q&A about that? You know, um, and I'm very flattered that people care to know what I think about stuff. Like, I appreciate that. You know, it takes trust. And finally, Lizette, what's the best thing in your life as a musician? We always talk about the challenges on this show and how to overcome them, but what is really that which brings you joy in knowing that you do this, what you are meant to do? You know, when I feel like I can look at myself in the mirror after a performance, and know that I did my best. That's always been my favorite feeling. Not, I mean, it's, it's always nice that people come to me and they say, Lisette, you know, you moved me, you were great, blah, blah, blah. And I always thank those people for that. But inside, if I didn't feel like I did very well, I still am not happy. And I'm almost never happy with the performance. I'm, I'm honestly, I very, <laughs> I always feel like, okay, uh, next time I'm gonna do this, 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 this differently, or I need to redo this and that, because I'm always trying to get better. And maybe it's a bad thing, because I feel like I've, I'm never gonna get to be perfect. There's no such thing. Um, but if I can come off of a aria or a performance or whatever and go, damn, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> I did really well. That is when I feel the best. And that's a very rare feeling. Yeah, it's never <laughs> it's happened to so, me. Well, so it's like a couple a times maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't say that that has happened too often in my life, but that is probably the best feeling, as an artist anyway. I mean, of course, there's the joy of travel. There's the joy of seeing new places. There's the joy of being in other countries and meeting other human beings and learning about other perspectives on things that you never expected you would ever get to uh, confront because you're around people who are different from you. That's a wonderful feeling, a joyful feeling. And I've had to just give another follow-up to my so-called final question. Okay. Which is, I'm wondering what's inspiring you these days, musically or otherwise. What inspires me? 
you know, I get inspired by everything that isn't music. <laughs> and I try to bring that on stage. Um, I love being outdoors. I love nature. Ever since I became a person who runs, I found that the most perfect place in the entire world is not on stage, um, is actually, you know, in a forest or on a mountain or near the sea or someplace where you feel really, really, really small. And you don't feel like the whole world is looking at you, but you're looking at the world. And you've flipped the perspective and that becomes your stage. And you can be in the audience for once and you can perceive this greatness, this vastness that is before you, that is creation. Um, whether you're religious or not, I don't think it matters. I think a lot of people are moved by the grandeur and the beauty of the world whenever they perceive that. I think when you have that moment, you know, um, that inspires me because when I have that feeling, I'm like, please let me remember this. Let me remember this zen, <laughs> this, this feeling of what it's like to be in the desert or you know, on a mountain or wherever it is that I am. And remember that when I'm on stage that maybe there are people in the audience who are having that exact experience with something that I'm doing on stage in a performance because there are people who feel that way when they come to the theater. So I try to bring, if you will, <laughs> you know, that, that feeling, that memory that is so perfect with me so that I can interpret something beautiful for the audience. Lizette, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to speak with you about life through music. Thank you. Likewise. Awesome. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>